Greetings friends, welcome to my channel and welcome to today's video. My name is Brittany, if you've never been here before, hello, hi, welcome to what we have going on here. So today's video is gonna be on a case that I heard about years ago. I was actually sitting here and I was thinking about it and I'm pretty sure that this movie came out prior to the people we're gonna discuss being actually convicted of their crimes and that was in 98, which means that this, when this case was happening and when I first saw this movie, I was younger than 10 years old. So it was a long time ago. Prob probably too young for me to be, you know, learning about a true crime case, but I guess now we know why I've been so interested in true crime and horror growing up, right? Thanks, Mom. So as a kid, I saw this movie and it had Piper from Charmed in it. So I was like, I wanna watch this movie. And she, in this movie, was in a love triangle that turned deadly. I had no idea then when I was watching it that it was based on a true story, but then I was thinking about it and I was like, I should look up if it was or not. And ever since I knew that it was, I was like, well, now I have to learn everything about it. So I did, and that's what this video is gonna be on. So while we are discussing this case, we're gonna be doing a little get ready with me, get ready with murder. So I'm gonna be doing my makeup while discussing the case, cause uh, that's what I like to do here. It combines three things that I'm very interested in, true crime, makeup, and filmmaking. So naturally, here we are. Before we get started, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and hitting the bell. I put out new videos every week and I would love to hang out with you. And now let's just get into discussing the Texas Cadet murder. So this story is on the tragic murder of Adrian Jones. So Adrian Jones, who her family called AJ, was a 16 year old sophomore at Mansfield High in 1995. Adrienne was a really friendly girl, popular, easy to get along with. Her One of her former teachers described her as sort of a cheerleader type, that kind of personality, that kind of energy. She was pretty, she cared about her appearance, liked to wear makeup to school, you know, like we all do, obviously. Um, but she was also sporty and she was on her high school, Mansfield High's track team. Unfortunately, there's not that much information on Adrian out there as her life was tragically cut short at 16 in what the media dubbed a deadly love triangle. So in 1995, David Graham, who was 17 or 18 at the time, I couldn't find for sure because I couldn't find his birthday online, um, and his girlfriend Diane Zamora, who was 17 at the time, started dating. And this was in 1995, the same year that this whole story takes place. Immediately, um, it, it was intense, like right off the bat, it was super intense. And within a month, they had announced their engagement to their families. People would describe the couple who knew them as being a little um, obsessed with each other to the point that it was unhealthy. And in David's own words, he was infatuated with her and she was obsessed with him. So the couple had planned to marry in uh, the year 2000 once they had both finished their um, respective military academy training, because you see, David and Diane were both really interested in joining the military. So Diane was a sophomore honor student at her high school, which was Crowley High, which is different than the school that David went to. And she was gonna be joining the Naval Academy with hopes of one day being an astronaut. Dream big. And David was a track star at Mansfield High. Remember the same school that Adrian went to and he had the dreams of becoming a pilot. That was like all he cared about was becoming a pilot. The, the couple's interest in the military is actually how they met in, in 1991. They were both volunteering in this program called the Texas Civil Air Patrol, which essentially taught them the basics in everyday life of being in the military. And this was a weekly thing that they both went to. It's unclear what happened between 1991 and 1995 when they finally got together, but all that we do know for sure is that once they got together, it was hot and intense and um, described by them and by Diane as untouchable and a different type of love than anyone had ever felt in life. But unfortunately, one night in late November or early December, this idea of the perfect love that Diana thought that her and David had was shattered because David confessed to her that he had cheated on her with a fellow uh, member of his track meet named Adrian Jones. So David said that one night, um, no, it was not one night, November 4th specifically, um, after a track meet, Adrian had asked for a ride home and instead of going straight home, they took a detour that led them to park behind the elementary school and elementary school, I don't know which one, and they had sex in his car. So Diane did not take this well, uh, it destroyed her. I read in her confession, which she later gave, um, 
which was so long. I read both hers and David's confessions to kind of, you know, compare their, uh, their accounts of the night. Um, she said that she was slamming her head into the wall and into the floor trying to crack her skull. She said that she just kept screaming at David, kill her, kill her. So the couple decided, and this is in David's own words, so let me read it out loud to you. When this precious relationship was damaged by my thoughtless actions, the only thing that could satisfy her womanly vengeance was the life of the one that had, for an instant, taken her place. So on December 3rd, 1995, at about 10.30 p.m., David called Adrian Jones on the phone. And even though her mom said that her normal phone curfew was 10 p.m., there's a hair, excuse me, um, she did allow Adrian to take the phone call. Um, David then arranged a date with her for that night where he would pick her up and she'd sneak out of her house. And the timeline on it was a little weird in both of their confessions. Um, one said 1230, one said like 1 a.m. So we're gonna say between midnight and 1 a.m. he was gonna be picking her up. So Adrian snuck out of her house to go um, meet David and he picked her up in Diane's car where Diane was hiding in the trunk of like the car. Duh. <laughs> and then and then David drove her and him and all of them to a deserted road near Grand Prairie, Texas. So apparently the initial plan that the couple had had was to have Diane sneak out of the trunk because there was like a, a latch where she could push the back seat back and she would go up behind Adrian and snap her neck the way you know you see people do in movies um, and then they would attach weights to her body and weigh her down in a lake. Unfortunately for them, I guess, um, when the attack actually took place, things did not go as expected for them. So apparently after they parked, um, Diane waited a little bit and then she pushed the seat back to kind of look out and see if it was the right time for them to begin. And when she looked out, Adrian had already had her seat reclined back and David was sort of leaning over her like he was gonna kiss her. And this um, enraged Diane, obviously. I think personally it's because when she saw that, it was sort of like a picture in her mind of what happened previously. Like this is what it looked like and it, you know, hit her there. He then waved Diane out and she crawled out and she attempted to snap Adrian's neck, but she realized that it's a lot more difficult than they make it look in the movies, obviously. Diane, you little 17 year old girl. So at this time, uh, David and Adrian started to struggle in the front seat. And Diane said that she was worried that Adrian was gonna hurt David. So she grabbed one of the weights that they were planning on um, weighing her down with, and she smashed it into Adrian's head. So it's unclear how, but the couple says that Adrian was able to escape the car through the open window, I'm assuming on the passenger side and she started to run out into a field. And Diane said to David, we can't let her get away. So David gets out of the car and follows her into the field um, where she had collapsed into a barbed wire fence due to her head injury. David had said he realized that he couldn't leave the one witness to their crime alive and that it felt like it was her or them. And he shot young Adrian twice in the head and then they left her in the field. The couple reports that their first words to each other when they took off and left Adrian in the field was, I love you, to one another. And um, then David says that Diane said, we shouldn't have done that, David. Duh. So that night they actually went to a friend's house to clean up. <laughs> So they went to a friend's house. Um, they then disposed of their clothes, cleaned out their car, and fell asleep together by a fireplace. They said that they were having a lot of trouble with it um, and that they felt a lot of regret and guilt immediately, but that's what they did. And the friend never said anything, which is weird because you would think you'd be like, oh, they came to my house and they had blood on them because they would because they murdered somebody. And then the next day they find a body of a teenage girl and you know, sure. And with that said, the next day, Adrian's body was found by a farmer in the field, badly beaten and shot, um, but the case went cold for nine months. So during those nine months, David and Diane had left to their respe respective military academies. Um, Diane was at a Naval Academy in Maryland, and David was at an Air Force Academy in Colorado. Now, I'm not sure why it may have been the guilt 
getting to Diane or it may be that she just wanted to brag about how strong her love with her long distance fiance was, but Diane started to brag and tell people about the murder. She told at least two classmates that we know of and one of those classmates went and reported it to the supervisors at the Naval Academy. So this was in 1996 and obviously that information got back to police um, in their hometown in Texas, right? Texas, yeah. And police then went and questioned Diane, which she denied everything. But even though she denied everything, she was suspended from the Naval Academy pending the investigation. Um, and shortly after that, David was brought in for questioning and giving a polygraph test, which he failed. And he then confessed and he gave a written confession. Two days later, Diane was also arrested and they showed her that David had confessed and she saw like his signature on the confession. And so she then confessed as well. So initially Diane, her story lined up with David's pretty perfectly with her taking the blame for both striking Adrian in the head and suggesting that they kill her in the first place. But over time, she started to change her story and so did David. The perfect couple had started to turn on each other because of course they did. Diane started telling police that she never actually intended to hurt Adrian. She just wanted to meet her because she thought that David was lying about the affair to make her jealous. Okay. She also stated that she initially um, gave the confession she did because she loved Graham and she was also afraid of him and she wanted to try to help protect his military career. She claimed that he was physically abusive and she was afraid that he would kill her if she didn't go along. I don't really believe this myself. Um, it's just my opinion, but without Diane's jealousy, I don't really see what the motive would be here for them to do this at all. That, that's what I'm thinking. Additionally, the details from Diane's initial confession line up with all of the injuries on Adrian's body and all of the evidence they had at the crime scene. And last, witnesses who Diane had confessed this to, the people at her naval base, said that she was not apologetic. She referred to Adrian as a tramp and said that she, they, that she would kill her again if she had the chance. So this doesn't sound like somebody who wasn't involved to me. Some jurors were actually swayed by Diane's little pity party story. <laughs> a few felt that she wasn't guilty of the murder, but just as an accomplice to David. Um, but due to the Texas law of parties, any accomplices to a crime like murder have to be sentenced as if they had committed the murder themselves. And this law I find very interesting because I had never heard about it before until recently because I've been looking into the case from um, Ohio, um, the Dylan Groves case, the case where the parents killed their little baby. I don't know if you've heard about this. I'm looking into doing a video on it. It's really, really sad. But in that case, they had the same type of law that even if you thought only one parent had actually killed the baby, if the other parent was an accomplice or complicit to the act, they could be tried and convicted of the actual murder as well, even if they didn't physically do it. So I, I found that to be um, interesting that I've heard about that twice now, but I didn't, I had never heard about that before. Anyways, the couple was tried uh, separately. They, it was decided that they'd be tried separately. And Diane was tried and subsequently um, convicted of capital murder in 1998. Shortly thereafter, David um, had his trial. And like Diane had done, he pointed the finger at her completely. He said that she actually did the murder and he wasn't even there. And that he then helped her conceal the evidence after the fact, since the gun um, was found in his house but he too was convicted of capital murder. Because of Adrian Jones's family's request, neither um, David nor Diana were given the death penalty. So they both ended up getting life in prison with the possibility of parole after 40 years, which I believe will be in 2036 for both of them. And Adrian's family, man, that takes some strength, right? To be like, please don't give the death penalty to these kids because they said that there had already been enough loss and we didn't need to lose any more young lives due to the situation. And I just see that as such like strength and maybe they're religious. I don't know, but I can't imagine that I would be strong enough to be like, don't kill these kids. You know, I feel like I would, I would, I don't know, you know? So they're just very strong people because I, I cannot even imagine if somebody killed my daughter being big enough to just not want them dead too. So something I found interesting in this case is both the prosecution and the defense um, stated that they didn't believe that the sexual encounter between David and Adrian ever happened. 
I could imagine that for the prosecution, they maybe would want to do that to try to make Adrian look better, like her reputation um, to be better in the case. And I imagine with the defense that they would want to take the motive away. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. In my opinion, I do think that they had a relationship. And let me let me tell you why. First, just the fact that David was able to get her out of the house to meet with him that late at night makes me think that there had to have been some sort of relationship there. Because just she's 16 years old and I'm putting myself in the shoes of a 16 year old girl. I've been there before and I can't think of another reason that she would leave and meet up with a guy in the middle of the night if it wasn't somebody that she was interested in. Okay. Additionally, the small details that Diane had said in her confession, like that the seat had been reclined back and that David was leaning over her. Those details I feel were too specific to be faked. Um, it seems like it was something that she noticed and it stuck in her head about that night. Cause this wasn't even in David's confession, but it stuck in Diane's head enough cause it upset her enough because it reminded her of what he had done. And I can't see why Adrian C would be back on that night if, she, if there hadn't already been something going on between them in the first place. But that's all just my opinion. So where are they now? Did their untouchable and so special and different love stand the test of time and stand up to being imprisoned? No. Initially, David and Diane would write each other love letters all the time, trying to keep their love and their relationship alive, kind of seeming like they thought they might get out of jail. But once the trial started, those letters uh, stopped, probably because they were turning on each other, you know? How are you going to stay and love somebody when they are trying to rat you out for a murder that you both committed? So Diane Zamora is currently incarcerated at the Skyview Institute in Texas. Um, I know that she had tried to appeal to get better housing or to be put in like solitary confinement because she says that she is such a famous criminal and her case is so publicized that other inmates were attacking her and she has reportedly become friends with, what is that woman's name? The bitch that killed Selena. Of course she is. In 2003, Diane married another inmate who had written her letters and they never actually met and they were married with like surrogates, I believe. Um, but that marriage ended in 2010. David Graham is currently in, uh, in custody in the Alred Institute in Texas. Um, he too married, I believe to another inmate and that was in 2010 and he earned himself a bachelor's degree in criminology. I heard in an interview that he wants to reach out to Adrian's family, but they want, they want none of that. He says that he's so sorry and that he loves them. And you know, I wouldn't talk to him either. <laughs> Diane sticks to her story that she is an innocent victim and that everything was perpetrated by David because he was her controlling and abusive boyfriend. Um, and though David during the trial did try to say everything was Diane, um, he has since admitted to his part in the murder, but he still insists that Diane was heavily involved, just like he had said in his initial confession. David has stated that he was stupid in love and that um, his arrest was actually a bit of a positive. Obviously the situation wasn't, but he says that he sees himself as being arrested as a positive because it allowed him to get out of the relationship with Diane. Love that. So that is the story of the love triangle that ended with a 16 year old girl losing her life. It's crazy, right? I, when I was younger and I saw this movie and I heard of this case, I had no idea how young these people actually were. And maybe it's just because I'm 31 years old, but man, these are like kids, right? 16 to die. That's so young and 17 and 18 to murder somebody. I mean, I know, that this happens all the time, but I don't know, as like an adult woman, that just seems so incredibly young and so pointless. I know that they're all pointless, but ah, just like, it's so stupid. They were so incredibly young. And I know when you're that age, everything just feels so intense and important and everybody you love, you love so hard because it's like the first time you've ever done it, but it was all literally for nothing and they 
did it on a re for a relationship they didn't even end up in. You know what I mean? They ended this girl's life. Her family will never get to see her grow up or get a career, graduate high school, get married, have kids. All any and all things she could have ever wanted to do, she can never do because these two kids murdered her literally over nothing. This just seems like a totally pointless and tragic loss of life that just should never have happened. Um, and that's just bananas to me. Ass bananas. Anyways, guys, that completes this video. Please let me know down below any videos that you would like to see in the future and let me know what you think about this case. Do you think Diane had more to do with it than she's saying? Who do you believe on this side? I'm, I'm really curious because I can see how some people would believe her. I just personally don't. So let me know down below. Do you think she was a victim? Do you think she was a leader? I kind of think she was a leader because I didn't even mention throughout the video, I forgot, but she's the oldest sibling in her family and he is the baby of his family. And I'm not saying that all oldest children end up being leaders, but we kind of are. I'm the oldest in my family and I feel like I'm definitely kind of a leader. I don't know, let me know. Please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by hitting the bell and subscribing because I do put out new videos every week and I would love to hang out with you. And thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else on the internet. I think that is amazing. You're tight, this is tight, and I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.